afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Chamber Foundation's breakout session, Building Digital Resilience in Cybersecurity. My name is Vince Fossey. I'm Executive Director for Cyber Policy and Operations at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's session. As a reminder to all panelists and participants, um, this uh, session is on the record um, and open to the press. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Brian Harrell, Assistant Director for Infrastructure Security at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency to moderate today's session. Brian, over to you. Well, thank you, Vince, very much. Uh, I have uh, the easiest job I, today. I get to, uh, to monitor really a bunch of rock stars and some folks that uh, many of you already know their names. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, joining us today at the ninth annual uh, Private Public Partnership Conference. As Vint just mentioned, I am the Assistant Director for Infrastructure Security within uh, CISA. Uh, believe it or not, people at CISA still do wear ties, uh, despite what my boss says. Uh, but my background is in industry. I don't come from inside the Beltway. Uh, you know, one day I'm going to go back to industry, and really my job is to ensure that uh, when I go back that I leave this place better than how I found it. And I think we're doing a really good job within CISA providing timely subject matter expertise, products, services, uh, and the ability to have a conversation back and forth between the public sector and uh, the private sector. And so uh, as communities around the world uh, begin to recover from the effects of COVID-19, uh, society grapples with you know, what we're looking at as, as the new normal and, and what that might look like. Uh, this global pandemic has disrupted nearly every aspect of our daily lives. Uh, the way we do business, how we worship, uh, the, how we receive it and, and education. And these disruptions really uncover our vulnerabilities and, and really shine a light on the need for total resilience. And that's protecting individuals, preparing communities, and really fortifying some of our critical systems that we have in the critical infrastructure uh, community. So now within uh, its ninth year, uh, building resilience through private public partnership conference really focuses on the collaboration uh, between uh, private, public, uh, nonprofit sectors to really help mitigate the effects of all disasters, both digital and, and physical. Uh, so this breakout session really explores the urgent need for building uh, digital uh, resilience uh, across the US public sector and pre presents an innovative yet practical model for, for doing so. Uh, all sectors need dynamic cyber protection plans, uh, which consider the inevitability of a cyber attack or compromise and outline the methods for appropriate prevention, uh, detection, response, recovery, and post-incidence uh, forensics. I often say resilience is the governance of uncertainty. And at the end of the day, we must assume that our worst day is right around the corner. And you know, one of the key questions that I have is, you know, have we prepared, have we developed relationships under blue sky conditions? Have we removed those single points of failure and have we added uh, redundancy to our systems? Have we exercised our plans? Uh, have we adjusted our response recovery plans uh, accordingly? And these are some of the major themes and, and questions that we should be asking ourselves, not only today on this webinar, but really throughout um, th this pandemic and really uh, moving forward as technology takes more and more center stage of, of our lives. From a CISA perspective, uh, we understand that the threat landscape is, is shifting. We continue to, see, continue to see the governance, excuse me, the, the convergence between physical and cybersecurity. Uh, we remain concerned with potential threats from insiders. Uh, and we recognize that nation state adversaries find critical infrastructure systems as high value targets uh, to attack. Uh, recently, uh, we've released a number of cyber products, including our securing uh, industrial control systems strategy, uh, our pipeline cyber risk mitigation infographic, which was uh, just released this week, and then our newest uh, cyber essentials will really highlight uh, having a cyber strategy, uh, making the appropriate investments and building an awareness uh, program. So today I'm excited to moderate this panel. I look forward to today's uh, discussions. Uh, we have a short period of time, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, joining us today, we have uh, John Zanni, uh, CEO of Acronis, uh, SCS, Bill Wright, Director of the Federal Government Affairs of Splunk, and uh, Greg uh, Young, who's the Vice President of Cybersecurity at Trend Micro. Uh, each panelist is going to have between uh, seven and ten minutes to provide some remarks, and then towards the end, uh, we're going to do kind of a moderated panel where I have a number of questions uh, to ask our panelists. But then again, if you have some great questions, I'd love to see them in the chat. 
and I can pass them by to really spur some thought leadership on today's um, panel. And so with that, uh, John Zanny, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you, Brian. And thank you all for joining this, um, uh, this session. Uh, I have a couple of slides uh, that I wanted to show you to set the, the groundwork. Uh, first is just about a slide of who we are. And I'll wait for the slide to come up. Uh, can you see the slide? Uh, I apologize. For me, it's a uh, dark screen. One second. Well, I'll start talking to, to save some time, and then you can always look at the slide later. Uh, so uh, just a little background on who Acronis uh, SES is. Uh, we're a cyber protection company that is uh, solely focused uh, there we go. It's up and running. We're good to go. Uh, is solely focused on uh, the U.S. Uh, public sector and protecting the uh, assets of the the U.S. public sector. Uh, we uh, are based in the United States, specifically in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, we only have U.S. citizens. Uh, we are a veteran employer, over 20% of my staff are U.S. veterans, and a veteran advocate through a, a foundation called Cronus SCS Vets that's 100% focused on uh, helping uh, transitioning veterans and military spouses uh, to find jobs uh, in cyber. Everything we do is through certified products and processes uh, to ensure the highest quality products uh, that come out of us, the market. Now, let's talk a little bit about digital uh, resilience. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the, the market uh, today, uh, before COVID, uh, there was already a fairly significant challenge in ensuring that data and digital assets would get protected uh, from cyber attacks whether it was malware, ransomware, uh, uh, and such. Uh, now, with the advent of COVID, uh, the confusion, uh, communications from uh, agencies like the WHO and the CDC, uh, people moving to a remote workforce where, uh, where they uh, are using less secure system has all been an opportunity for bad actors uh, to uh, increase their attacks and get uh, be able to profit uh, from this environment. And despite what you might have heard that some of them said they will not attack hospitals or they will uh, not attack government agencies that are helping to fight this pandemic, it's all false. Uh, you look at the data and uh, these attacks uh, have increased and they're coming from very sophisticated and um, organized and well-funded uh, organizations. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I wanted to give you a few examples uh, here. Uh, take a look at the Department of Defense. In January, uh, there was a cryptocurrency uh, mining botnet. Uh, if you don't know what that is, is in uh, some ransomware now doesn't encrypt your system and ask you for Bitcoin. It actually just stays in the background unbeknownst to you and uses your computer's resources uh, to mine cryptocurrency and make money that way. Uh, so that's one of the more sophisticated ways that they can uh, essentially generate revenue or income uh, from you without even knowing you're doing it. In February, the US uh, DISA agency uh, suffered a data breach uh, that potentially exposed hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, in March, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services was targeted by a cyber attack that wanted to slow the agency's response to the ongoing pandemic. They do this because they know these are situations where people will be more inclined to pay the ransom because of so many uh, lives at risk or uh, business at risk uh, if they don't. And, and then um, 
in April, the WHO uh, has seen, was seen as uh, reported that they've seen a significant increase in attacks uh, by uh, bad actors. In, in some cases, nation states, uh, in this case, uh, Iran. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Now, why, why, uh, no, previous one before that. There we go. Uh, so uh, why is this happening? Uh, where is that opportunity? So first, uh, we move to a home environment that's much, much less secure. Uh, none of us have commercial grade routers, or at least most of us don't, including me uh, in their home. Uh, a lot of us are sharing devices with other family members who might not have been trained on security skills. I know there are no children in my household that have passed the security ones on one test uh, that uh, we offer at my company. Uh, and some of those devices on home or networks can get uh, compromised and then compromise the corporate networks. Uh, you, I'm sure you've seen on the news, Zoom, Teams, WebEx applications uh, that have had to uh, shore up their security uh, just uh, because they weren't designed for this environment where there was no corporate IT uh, to enforce the right configurations to really stop attackers to go after these remote workers. Uh, they've improved it, but a defense in-depth model is always best uh, when uh, you are trying to protect your digital assets. Then um, Verizon uh, published their mobile security uh, uh, index just recently. And I wanted to share a few data points here uh, that I, uh, I, uh, I thought were interesting. First, 75% of public sector organizations said mobile devices are critical to operations. Uh, what I know is a lot of the uh, agencies also know they cannot afford uh, to give a dedicated mobile device to every uh, employee, which means uh, supporting bring your own device model. 71% uh, said that within five years, mobile will be their primary means of access, uh, accessing cloud-based services. 56% uh, have experienced a major mobile-related compromise. 36% uh, um, admit that they uh, sacrificed mobile security to get their job done. Uh, I was on an earlier webcast today where uh, the uh, webcaster actually said it's better if you don't use VPN so you get better performance, which means compromising security. Uh, we, there's a lot of educating to do yet uh, to really get individuals uh, to understand how easily they can be vulnerable uh, with these digital assets that are critical to businesses. So how do we think about protecting digital assets? Next slide, please. We, we think in the terms of complete cyber hygiene. Uh, so that you can uh, guarantee operational assurance. And uh, this should sound fairly familiar to some of you because it's also the way you actually prevent and treat Ill illnesses uh, through prevention, detection, response, recovery, and forensics. Uh, so you want to make sure first, uh, if it's a biological virus, uh, that your vaccine and you have good hygiene. This is, in the digital world, it's about vulnerability, patch management, backup, with continuous data protection, really proactive cyber hygiene. Being able to detect if something wrong or you're going to a bad website or that uh, you might be vulnerable for or in an attack. Being able to respond quickly to that attack and block it. Technology acts the same way uh, as we do with medicine. And unfortunately, uh, eventually, um, sometimes the attacks do just get through or, um, or a device gets damaged. And in those cases, you need to be able to recover quickly and really understand what happens so that you can mitigate uh, that happening from again, against. So if you really use that same uh, way to prevent and treat illnesses for cyber hygiene, you're really on your path to think about uh, how to protect your digital assets. And then next and last slide. So I, I'll propose of how we think about uh, this model for digital resilience. Uh, we call it SAPAS. 
uh, safety, accessibility, privacy, authenticity, and security. And what does this really mean? Is first you need a reliable copy of your data that you can recover and that's free from ransomware or other attacks, uh, that you have access to this data anywhere at any time, that you have complete control over the data and where it goes. Do you know where your data is stored? All of it? Uh, very hard to find uh, or figure out in some cases. Authenticity. Has anybody tampered with that data? Uh, is those Are those pictures you've put up there or that document you sign really the document that you get when you download it again? And then make sure that you have the right level of security and protection against cyber threats. If you do this, if you are uh, SAPAS ready or cyber protected, as we say, uh, then you're well along your way to make sure that you have digital resilience. And so with that, I'll hand it back and hopefully this will give you some food for thought for the next uh, 45 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. This is Brian again, I appreciate it. Uh, off to uh, Bill Wright, uh, your view of the world. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Brian. Really appreciate it. And of course, appreciate everything that you're doing there. Uh, at CISA. My name is Bill Wright. I'm Director of Government Affairs at Splunk. Um, we are the data to everything platform. Um, we turn data into action. We tackle some of the tougher challenges around IT, IoT, uh, security, and of course data challenges. So you'll, you'll notice a, a common theme uh, in my uh, presentation and answers to question, and that is the true belief that uh, um, the importance of data. Um, you know, as Brian put very well, COVID-19 uh, has been one of the biggest challenges uh, many of us have faced in our lifetimes. Uh, it's not merely a business disruption or an economic crisis. In fact, it's both, uh, but also human catastrophe and a stress test on government systems and the government's business continuity plans. Uh, it's forced us all to rethink uh, how most of us do our jobs as we all uh, sit here in our uh, respective homes, in most cases. Uh, the virus has forced us, uh, in a sense, it underscores exactly where we are as a technological society. Um, and I think we are at the dawn of the data age, uh, where digital data can allow us to, to devise effective, rapid responses to some of these global challenges, uh, like COVID, um, but not just COVID. I've been accused of being a little bit too optimistic, um, but with all the negatives ushered in by this pandemic, it also opens up some, I think, exciting opportunities and may accelerate uh, our journey toward a more resilient, connected, data-driven future. Um, I truly believe data can help save lives. Data is essential and will ultimately be what drives true resiliency, uh, digital resiliency. Uh, but only if we do it right. So from the federal government to all the members of the chamber to your local grocery chain, uh, we need to accelerate our data use to become more resilient and get everybody back to work here, back to their workplaces, I should say, eventually. Uh, the data we need is all out there. We just need to dedicate ourselves to investigating that data and then, of course, acting on it. I think one of the um, core principles to resiliency is around IT modernization. And I think this last couple of months has really proven that out. Um, I think COVID has acted as an overdue and, and perhaps unwanted uh, catalyst for IT modernization uh, across the government. It's important to recognize just this massive transformation that has occurred uh, within our government over the last few months. You know, According to the Washington Post, only 40% of federal employees were set up to work from home prior to the outbreak. Uh, since then, we have seen a, a Herculean effort. Um, what many people I think don't appreciate is just the scale involved in that, millions of workers, the sheer complexity, um, how many agencies were on legacy networks um, that the government was still operating. So personally, and, and speaking for Splunk as well, we have tremendous respect for what our federal partners uh, have managed to accomplish. Um, you know, one data point here to, to paraphrase our former US CIO, Suzette Kent, those organizations that invested in modern technology, specifically cloud and, and the shared services model, allowed those organizations to be more nimble 
during the pandemic allowed them to pivot uh, and scale, making them, in fact, more resilient organizations. Um, it's not to say there weren't bumps uh, along the road. Uh, many of those made the news. Um, those organizations were still weighed down by legacy systems and they struggled. Uh, but during this transition period, uh, two problem spaces or areas, I think, came up and that we were hearing from our, our customers um, on the remote work side. How do I enable remote work in the right way? Manage the capacity needs of my organization. How do I monitor, uh, ensure that performance is at that acceptable level? Um, and of course, how do I do this securely with such a huge increase in attack service surface with all the remote workers and new devices as John really well laid out in his presentation. Um, I would also note that state and local governments have been particularly vulnerable uh, to cyber attacks during this time. Um, second area of, of, of concern and questions and problems that we were hearing is around the massive uptick in digital demand for the government. During this time, citizens are relying on, on government now more than ever and more than we had ever imagined, frankly. So think unemployment sites, small business loans. How do we prepare for that surge in digital um, services that our citizens uh, are using and demand? Um, what I would say and an observation is both of these problem areas, I think at their core are in fact data problems. And if I have the right information at my fingertips at the right time, I can make rapid data-driven decisions. So when you take a step back and view this pandemic um, uh, from a little bit back and, um, and there are response to it, almost all these problems are data problems. Decision makers or policymakers need the right data at the right time to make confident decisions to carry out uh, their mission. And I think a good example of this is something that we're doing at the state level. So, Splunk recently signed a deal with a US state to help them track and monitor COVID-19. So this state is using Splunk COVID-19's dashboard to track the current status of the virus across um, uh, the state and provide data analytics to drive tactical decisions by the state's governor and of course the Department of Health officials. Um, Splunk's also being used by the same state to ensure that the 30,000 person workforce who've suddenly been asked to adapt to work remotely can stay online and deliver these emergent, emergency services to the public. Um, lastly, the same state is using Splunk to help quickly scale overburdened system. Um, the state's unemployment system, for instance, has seen a 10 time increase in unemployment applications. So we're helping their IT move more efficiently. So that's, that's my view of the world. Data and modern technology have got to be core um, to our strategy on digital resiliency. And I look forward to folks' uh, questions and to um, hearing from the other panelists. Thank you, Brian. Oh, you're welcome, Bill. And uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. We appreciate your thought leadership and what it is that you're doing uh, as a company to try and move uh, America forward. Uh, Greg Young, I guess uh, to you, my friend uh, from Trend Micro, uh, your view of the world. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, there's really good comments. Thanks to, thanks to our fellow panelists. It's, it's been great. Um, you know, I, uh, I learned in the Army a couple of lessons. One was that uh, any food that's boiled in a bag is probably going to be really bad. And second, under stress, you really kind of learn in organizations, cap people's capabilities. Uh, during the last few months, I think we've seen a remarkable revolution in the public-private partnerships, uh, especially on the behalf of governments uh, interoperating with the private sector in response to this. Um, you know, we've got offices around the world and, uh, you know, a couple of hundred million endpoints under visibility. And we learned some lessons there. So one thing I saw was that the sort of the movement of the partnerships really changed quickly where it was typically, you know, government-led industry follow in a lot of these committees and, you um, especially around digital infrastructure resilience, uh, really quickly became a partnership. And in many countries, uh, many jurisdictions also became uh, a real partnership. Uh, we saw some changes, for example, such as the role that internet exchanges played uh, within this. And that was kind of a surprise, I think, to many of the participants. We know the internet's there. We know kind of how it works, of course. But we faced some really interesting uh, challenges around the world. One was... Um, staff getting physical access to the internet exchanges, for example. 
uh, those buildings were owned by third parties who put in policies during COVID that said, uh, right, nobody goes into the office. Well, you know, these are critical people. Well, they're not the government. They're, you know, they're not uh, police forces or medical. So no, you're not critical. Uh, and in many cases, these exchanges don't want to advertise where their locations are uh, for security reasons. So those are some uh, big surprises. Um, you know, as we saw this revolution in home, you know, sort of, you know, work at home suddenly happen, there was some surprises there and some not. Um, the biggest one, I think, was around the economic factors that said, you know, hey, many people are just not set up for it. Companies were competing to get even laptops ordered for staff. And we saw some real security implications of this. So the better organizations and, uh, you know, federal departments who reacted uh, quite well did things, for example, like they really provided security above and beyond for the home workers. So they recognized that it was not only the, you know, the uh, organization provided equipment, but the home equipment would need protection just as much. You know, they're leaving this nice bubble of the home office and your, or the work, work, work office, and you're coming to a home environment, which is uh, probably one of the best attack services going. Um, you know, you've got insecure routers, you've got, uh, you know, uh, teenagers and spouses who don't believe in, you know, uh, uh, putting security software on devices, um, and they need protection as well. So I think that expanding that bubble was really part of, I think, one of the lessons. Um, many organizations gave licenses for software, or they already had licenses and didn't recognize it for multiple devices per employee. So that was useful. Also helping out um, uh, partners and suppliers as well. Suddenly, you know, their staff are going to be working at home, communicating onto your networks, uh, you know, contractors and the like, um, making sure that they're included as part of this bubble. That sort of employment status is no longer uh, a big factor. It's really, you know, these are all part of your network and uh, there's a great democratization there suddenly going on. So I think there's some good lessons there as well. Um, and other, other uh, you know, across the supply chain, even for providing secure storage, um, you know, uh, staff and their, you know, will find ways to, you know, store stuff in the most efficient way. You know, a, a private Dropbox is not a great thing to use. Instead, give staff the storage they need, um, you know, expand to enterprise editions of of these storage devices to at least have it observable and securable by, uh, you know, by the organization. So some really good lessons there. A really great reaction on the part of the private sector for some URL takedowns. As we saw, um, you know, many COVID related scams or, you know, ransomware distribution ones, you know, masquerading as, uh, you know, uh, uh, payment plans or unemployment applications. Um, some of the uh, most noteworthy tech companies out there did a, actually a really good job in reacting quickly alongside government partners in doing those URL takedowns. Uh, that was at lightning speed too, so that was a real success story. As we look across, I think the, uh, you know, in the other aspects that we've learned from this, um, there were some uh, remarkable surprises about the resilience of the internet. Uh, we saw some real challenges, for example, when there was popular game downloads happening or updates, you know, just when staff went to work from home. That sounds trivial, but it actually resulted in noticeable degradation for many organizations in performance, especially as they all moved to Zoom you know, Zoom and other platforms uh, really quickly. Um, and behind the scenes, it did in fact stress out a lot of the infrastructure in some countries and jurisdictions. So uh, there are some great lessons there. Um, I think some tech companies learned some lessons as well. Uh, those who are starting to bring employees home or back into the office from home and they had to reverse, uh, reverse their infrastructure quickly. Um, and that provided an opportunity for uh, scammers and attackers as well to try to attack um, employee helplines. Um, you know, as they're trying to get connected, as they're calling in, the level of security dropped in many organizations as they were willing to forego a lot of the checks and validations they would do to make sure somebody who's requesting a password reset is in fact that, you know, work at home employee and not somebody trying to take advance or advantage of stress that um, help desk staff. So it's been an interesting period, but uh, most of it's been very optimistic. I also think the resurgence we've seen in use of, um, you know, software as a service some, uh, you know, Fed, state, local organizations move very quickly to that through necessity and the, uh, the wheels didn't fall off. Um, so it's been, I think there's been some unintended benefits from this, from this bad, bad experience we've had, um, but there's uh, certainly a lot of security lessons we're still learning today. All right, uh, well, Greg, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the panelists, John, Bill, Greg, appreciate uh, your time and your thought leadership on this. So we've come now to, I guess, the fun part, which is question and answer period. And so um, let me remind everyone that uh, to submit a question via the hub chat and the webinar, 
uh, please go ahead and do that. I think you'll find it off to the right there. Uh, feel free to uh, type in your, your question and I'll be able to see it and hopefully uh, make topsy-turvies of it and try and get something uh, smart out to the panelists. And we already have one and it's actually really good and it's a bit of a, a trend already that I'm seeing. And that is how is the cyber workforce adapting to these increased attacks? Uh, are companies able to maintain the workforce needed to protect themselves uh, from such attacks? And I guess really at the end of the day, it's about we're in this degraded environment. Everyone is working from home. It's a new normal. Uh, is the subject matter expertise still there? Is everyone still fully engaged? Are we as situationally aware today than we were just six months ago? And from a workforce perspective, are, are, are we better? Are we the same? Uh, and, and do we pivot really as a country moving forward from a workforce perspective post COVID? Yeah, Brian, I can jump in with a, with a comment here. I think this is a, a great question. And I think you just said that uh, it's beginning to be a trend. I, I completely agree. And I think a part of building a resilient uh, organization um, like this, your personnel and your workforce is you know, truly gonna be a, a, a challenge. People are an important part of any mission, uh, but most agencies, if not all, um, uh, are short, um, especially during COVID when organizations are working hard to keep that minimum uh, physical footprint um, in the security operations centers and elsewhere. Um, the security operations teams, especially during COVID are facing but I would say exponentially growing volume of security events. Um, and as the federal budget moves forward over the next few years, uh, post COVID, I would imagine our federal partners are gonna be asked to even do, uh, do even more with less in the future. Um, so I would say one, one observation, uh, I think that we've, the tech community's made a lot of strides around automation and automating process, um, especially around security automation. Um, unfortunately, relatively few organizations are, are using automation capabilities. Um, I was just reading a, a, a 2019 study uh, by Ponemon that re uh, revealed only 23% of organizations are leveraging automation to any significant uh, degree. That means that three quarters of organizations are still relying on, on manual operations, which make it more difficult for organizations to manage these security events, all that burden um, falls already to the uh, or falls to the already understaffed cybersecurity teams, exacerbating those problems related to skills gap and and uh, workforce shortages. So, effective and sustainable cyber resilience, I think, really hinges um, uh, on increased automation. Uh, and these security automation tools exist; they can act as a force multiplier for existing security and IT operations teams. And at the end of the day. Um, security automation tools can really clear out a lot of that routine, repetitive tasks and free up our personnel to do what they do best, and that's to go after a lot of the hard problems. So orchestration automation tools, I think, are a core pillar of any comprehensive approach to cyber resilience, and these concepts, I think, are probably even more critical during this COVID time response. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And John, if you don't mind, uh, same question, but I, I love if you wouldn't mind just kind of drilling down just a little bit. What do you think the impact has been on small and minority businesses, uh, specifically tribal businesses, uh, as they try to assess the impact of their systems and their workforce? Any so, thoughts on that? Yep, uh, absolutely. So the, the good news, and, and I think uh, Greg and Bill alluded to this, is there, there's definitely an increased awareness that you need to be more secure. And the move to the cloud, uh, at least from the, the government side, uh, in the last few months has just been fantastic. Definitely exceeded my expectations of what they would be capable of doing. Uh, the bad news is that uh, we have old systems or the government has old systems. Uh, some of them uh, don't talk to each other. There's a need for expertise to really understand how to use the tools that are out there. Uh, we have some very good tools, for example, but uh, without the experts to know uh, how you configure those networks and uh, set up those backup plans and have those antivirus systems, uh, it becomes more difficult. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the number of cybersecurity jobs uh, in the United States grew by close to 50% since COVID. Uh, the gap is around 600,000 open positions. It's one of the reasons we started Acronis SES Vets. Uh, because uh, I learned that actually U.S. Uh, veterans um, 
have a, a natural propensity to work in the security space. They're just missing some of the official certificates needed to get those jobs. And so we've been working to help fill that gap. Uh, I'd say what we're doing might be just a drop in the, in the, in the pond, uh, but at least it's something. For those uh, minority organizations or, or tribes, they have the same challenge. Uh, and so they need those tools that are uh, reasonably uh, at a reasonable cost, relatively easy to use. So you don't need somebody with a PhD to figure out how to secure your environment. And, and, and you know, just some basic guidance. The is if your systems are up to date and you have a good antivirus system and good uh, backup and recovery system, you're 80% of the way there. Uh, so that, that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, Greg, before we move on, any thoughts from you? Yeah, a couple of quick ones. I, th I think we've lost some visibility in the last few months. You know, as more uh, employees move to uh, unmanaged devices um, for privacy reasons, a lot of organizations haven't been able to manage them as closely or carefully, plus they're shared in a household. Uh, we've lost some visibility there. Also more encrypted pipes, more VPNs now than there were previously from the outside. So we've lost some visibility there. So I really like Bill's comments about automation, better using the people that we have today uh, for the exciting work, not things that we can you know, have automation use. But we definitely need greater pools of information uh, to base those security decisions on there and to link them. And we're seeing some great work through uh, you know, machine learning and moving towards AI to do that. On the personnel side, um, you know, what has not advanced is how we uh, hire, train, and um, advance people in the cybersecurity field. Got some incredible resources there, um, but I think we've got, you know, some medieval hiring and uh, advancement and just, you know, how we how we bring these people into the organization. So uh, any leaders out there, I would really encourage you to revisit, you know, how you do that and maybe sort of reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. Greg, you kind of uh, read my crystal ball here on the next question. Uh, and to the larger group here, you know, what aspects of resilience do you believe would be the most impactful? to uh, the public sector? And really, for example, uh, would resilience be most impacted by personnel, as you've just kind of alluded to, Greg? Uh, is it new technology? Is it funding? Is it acquisition? Is it making the right investments? Inevitably, the answer is all of the above. But if you have your next one incremental dollar in which to invest, where are you going first? I can jump in here. You know, I think the um, sort of the the MVP of uh, this uh, COVID um, response has been around IT modernization, movement to the cloud. Um, I think those organizations that invested um, early in, in cloud and, and SaaS, uh, SaaS offerings, again, found themselves in a much better place, more nimble, uh, more, uh, more quickly able to um, pivot um, and able to scale um, those organizations that relied on um, their sort of legacy, legacy tools and networks uh, suffered and have had a tough time coming back. So I think it's been a tough lesson, um, um, but I think going forward, um, IT modernization across the board um, is, um, is probably the key pillar uh, to, to, um, to resiliency going uh, in the future. I, I would agree. Uh, the uh, you know we have to remember that the bad actors are not kids in a dorm room that are just bored on a Saturday, right? These are nation states, heavily funded, organized crime. Uh, they're using the same technology we are to innovate: artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, uh, they have it all, which means that unless you have tools that that are supplied by the experts who are really thinking about how to provide digital resiliency, you just can't keep up uh, with uh, uh, these bad actors. So I would say that is the most uh, important uh, first step is really to take it, uh, modernize your IT and take advantage of those latest tools. Yeah, my next dollar would I would spend on, um, you know, correlation and discovery. And by that, I mean about, you know, one at six or one in eight dollars now uh, spent on IT is spent outside the CIO's organization. So, you know, anyone with a credit card can buy, you know, enterprise or, you know, government IT resources suddenly and put it somewhere that may not be secured. So uh, never has there been more need for this. You know, we see people move, 
applications move, servers move, infrastructure moves now, and it's all in an Etch-a-Sketch. So we can secure that with discovery and correlation, uh, and but also having to uh, put some prevention in there as well. Yeah. And I think there's uh, also a good opportunity for this, you know, uh, public-private partnership aspect. You know, bringing the two cogs together of government and private to share lessons there. Um, you know, every hour I've spent on a committee or in an organization meeting like that has always been worthwhile. Sure. Building off of some of uh, what John just said, um, you know, how has the use of cloud and other SaaS offerings uh, enabled businesses to continue to work to secure some of their remote settings? Yeah. You know, interesting. I think that, um, you know, when you make the case for cloud, it was always recognized that, um, you know, from a financial standpoint, that there were some benefits. Um, I, I think that uh, the realization now is that the benefits go well beyond um, financial. I'd say specifically the ability to set up new cloud-based solutions um, uh, when the on-premise data center may not be accessible, which uh, has, has been the case. Uh, fast access to real-time data to influence these rapid decisions uh, that I discussed. I think those are two uh, primary benefits um, to cloud and SaaS offerings that we've seen over the last couple of months. I would add, I'll give our company as an example, the way we built our infrastructure, we used a zero trust model. So there's a network only for uh, employee or company owned devices, a network for employees who bring their own devices. Uh, instead of depending on VPN, every application we access requires dual factor authentication uh, through uh, uh, approved um, authenticators, which means that when we had to move to 100% remote, it was completely seamless. Uh, it just it just worked and it just happened. Now, you could call me a genius for having done that or just really lucky. Um, only time will tell. Uh, but that's made a huge difference. It, it means we didn't miss a beat uh, when we went 100% uh, remote on March 13th, I believe it was. Some real rich dialogue that's happening in the, in the chat box, and I appreciate it. Uh, one of the themes I'm picking up on is surrounding cybersecurity standards. And I'll be honest with you, I cringe just a, a little bit as a recovering uh, regulator, uh, somebody who's done a lot of standards in the past. Um, but uh, can you outline what cybersecurity standards used in the professional world uh, that need to become the primary steps in the next version of maybe that common home network protections uh, to protect the, the telework vulnerabilities? Is, is there an evolution? Is there a maturation to some of the cybersecurity standards that are out there now that maybe somebody like not me should be focused on in regulating down the road? Well, not uh, not allowing your, your you to use your child's name as a password would probably be a good start. Or uh, I logged into my home router uh, this week just because I had trouble connecting to a new smart scale, and it turns out that router uh, the the original um, uh, password uh, and user was admin and password. The words mm -hmm. admin and password, right? So that's an example where every router made by uh, this version of Netgear uh, has the exact same uh, username and password. Uh, so these are the kinds of very simple things that we could bring into the, the consumer world that we just don't do in the business world uh, that would uh, radically make uh, the networks more secure. Yeah, and I would, I would add that uh, those, those uh, common username and passwords, of course, are, are all available on, on Shodan and, and some other sites. So um, certainly a, a huge vulnerability, but I think you're right. There are some um, perhaps simple steps uh, that can be taken with the manufacturers um, um, to ameliorate those. Yeah, and it seems more so in the United States, because like I, I know um, I have some friends who live in France, for example, and when they got their router, uh, they had a big long number in the uh, the underneath the router that they had to type in, which was uh, actually quite annoying, but at least you knew that no one was going to guess that number, right. uh, which here I, I don't see that happening in the US. Yeah, standards are challenging. I think for you know company policies to set standards for staff is the really key one, uh, you know, really take care of your, your home first. And by that, I mean sort of a one pager, you know, policy, very human readable, understandable, not a binder. Um, and bombard your staff with kindness in terms of the tools. Don't make them go jump through hoops to get a new router uh, because the one they have is known to be insecure. 
Um, you know, and, and, and even, you know, what we've seen, for example, in supply chain, um, you know, we've seen some terrible things in medical devices where uh, the inability to patch them has been a real issue. So just making uh, patching things, uh, you know, easier, help your staff stay up to date. If they need newer software, if they need security software, just, you know, make it available to them. What I was alluding to in that supply chain comment, by the way, it was interesting that uh, we found that there was, um, you know, a, a reselling of medical equipment going on where um, there were uh, putting new barcodes on it to make it appear to be a newer version, which they could resell for more. And when it came time for security to try to patch these Internet of Things medical devices, the patches would brick them, much like trying to put a Windows 95 uh, or Windows 10 patch on a Windows 95 system. So uh, all these issues, you know, once we started to get really distributed, it really come home. So, you know, whatever devices you're giving your staff, um, you know, just clarity for that and just, you know, not making it really hard to talk to security about them. In the uh, chat forum here, uh, I think we've opened up the door uh, surrounding regulation. I'm a little timid to go inside, but uh, you know, one of the questions was asked, um, you know, and I'll paraphrase here, but uh, you know, we have some cybersecurity regulation. We have NERC SIP, we have the light touch in the chemical sector, we have some in the financial sector. Um, given the rise in cyber attacks, do you foresee more stringent regulations coming down the pike? And that's where the question ends. Let me just add some commentary. Um, you know, regulation isn't the answer to everything. However, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, is there some truism? Is there there's some wisdom to additional regulation? Or do we think we're good? Do we think we just need to add flexibility, best practices, uh, et cetera, to move the needle on this? Or do we really need to come up with a black and white checklist mentality kind of regulatory program? Well, uh, Brian, you mentioned truism, and if there's one truism in Washington, it's that technology uh, moves much faster than policy ever will. Ever will. Um, that, to me, is the challenge in creating good cybersecurity policy, uh, is that by the time you have it, and as you mentioned, a, a checklist, um, um, technology and cyber attacks and cyber attackers have now moved beyond that, um, um, you know, that said, I think uh, you know there may be some some room uh, in some specific uh, industries for uh, regulation. I think I've been saying with each major cyber attack that um, oh gosh we're going to have uh, you know data breach legislation coming down the line. I think I started saying that seven eight years ago, um, and uh, and and here we are. So um, I don't see anything um, in the uh, immediate uh, in the immediate future. Yeah, I think, you know, just to jump in here from, from the chamber's perspective on the regulatory front, I think what we we expect, you know, certainly out of the NDA process are, are several key provisions that that could go a long ways in, in further uh, enhancing the public-private partnership between industry, critical infrastructure, and, and government agencies like CISA and, and others. Um, you know, key, key among them um, will be, you know, Chambers endorsed, you know, the, the position of a national cyber director. Um, that's an important one. Um, we've endorsed um, CISA's, uh, you know, subpoena authority um, to provide uh, critical infrastructure owners and operators with key vulnerability information um, that they are not able to otherwise um, glean from internet service providers. Um, and there's a number of others that I think are could go a long ways in, in enhancing. Um, and really changing kind of the risk model and the risk calculus um, to critical infrastructure, um, the business community at large. And, you know, frankly, there's a role for regulation, um, but regulation in and of itself um, it is, is poorly attuned to um, uh, and poorly calibrated to such a dynamic uh, threat as cyber is. I think FIPS 140 is a great example of an enabling standard that helps businesses you know, have been very, very successful in making our cryptography more secure. Um, you know, as it's aged, it hasn't aged well in one way, which is that, you know, as we have to change software and when we find bugs in it, because we're so good at finding vulnerabilities nowadays, um, organizations were afraid to say, I'm going to be using, you know, a non FIPS approved version, but I know this one is free from vulnerabilities. So what do we do? And, you know, and FIPS, the FIPS standards folks are evolving and they're producing a third version that's going to handle that, um, you know, sort of a ramping of, um, of changes. So I think uh, there's some, some good stuff out there we could uh, use better. 
Is John uh, regulation uh, the boogeyman or help? No, it, it's a bit of both, right? So without the tools to help implement those rules, uh, it just gets hard for people to do it. The other part is uh, we haven't really talked about uh, classification of data. Uh, so, um, you know, if somebody takes a picture of me and puts it on the internet and gives me blue hair instead of black hair, it might be annoying, but it's not the end of the world. If my medical data is uh, published uh, there, that could be more problematic, right? Uh, uh, I know I've had my identity stolen a couple of times due to leakage of my social security number and such, and it's really annoying uh, to have to uh, deal with that. And so uh, we do need regulation, especially for critical infrastructure, critical data, uh, and then make sure there are the tools to they can abide by it. Because without the tools, uh, then it's just uh, writing on paper that no one can implement. All right, back to uh, resilience, but I, uh, I'm enjoying the provocative uh, conversation here. So across the uh, public sector, are there specific programs or organizations that you feel exemplify this approach to dynamic planning and resilience uh, organizations that may serve maybe as a good role model for others. I don't want to, you know, throw anyone under the bus. I don't necessarily want to gloat on anyone either, but there's some key foundational um, organizations or groups out there that are just doing a great job. Sure. I'd like to call out maybe uh, MITRE, uh, you know, the MITRE attack framework as a group, a uh, nonprofit that's really helped advance our understanding of how attackers work and helping organizations and governments respond very well to it. So, you know, shout out to MITRE for, for helping us model the uh, attacks that the bad guys do better. John, Bill, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I don't want to call out any particular agency, but I know there are, are far more positive uh, stories um, in sort of the COVID response time than there are negative. I mean, you, you look at the the effort that came out of just one agency, look at DOD, I think they brought 900,000 workers um, to, um, uh, to, to work online in a short, you know, essentially overnight. Incredible. Um, um, you know, you have to ha hands off and if you hats off and if you think about how that went uh, all the way across all of the agencies, I mean, really is incredible. Um, that said, those organizations that um, um, you know, had modernized their IT, uh, in particular around cloud and SaaS, had an easier time, and those that uh, did not struggled. Um, but there are good lessons uh, to take all the way across. I, I heard two examples at a DOD uh, webcast just uh, last week. The US Navy, uh, pre-COVID, had 10,000 VPN lines. Hmm. Uh, they now have 250,000. So wow. within a very, very short period of time, uh, they were able to enhance their IT infrastructure to be able to handle the work, remote workers. Uh, really impressive, right? Uh, that, that's a nightmare uh, uh, kind of orders from your boss to say, I know you have 10,000 lines, now I want 250,000. Uh, the SBA, the, the Small Business Administration, they went from zero uh, virtual desktops, uh, so VDI, to over 5,000 uh, uh, within a couple of months as well uh, because of COVID. These are uh, massive, uh, complex implementations that went really fast. And both of them, uh, to your point, Bill, said the reason we could do this is because we had already planned to move to the cloud and had some experience. And so it was really accelerating what we were already doing versus starting from scratch. So that made a big difference. Uh, a question from the mind of Brian here. Uh, I come from industry um, and I know we had an epiphany back in the 80s and 90s where we really started to focus on safety. And we had that safety moment where investment and uh, training programs were all very wrapped around this idea of safety, making sure that when our people go out, they come home that night, they're not killed, they're not injured, they're not maimed, et cetera. How do we move industry now towards a culture of security and a culture towards resilience? How do we make that investment justification? How do we articulate to the chief procurement officer or the chief operating officer or the chief executive officer that this is wise investment in cyber and digital resilience. Yes, they see it on the news just about every single day, um, but from a dollars and cents perspective, 
what are the, the, the key words and the tricky phrases to mention to them to really move the needle on digital resilience? I think one of the key factors is going to be, you know, really stating a clear business case and remove from them the fear that it's going to be shelfware. You know, I think we've been our own worst enemies in security in terms of, you know, putting forward solutions that aren't practical or usable. But if it's going to have a real business case and a bit, not necessarily dollars, but in terms of, for example, taxpayer value or impact on, on citizens, um, really state that clearly. And if there's going to be a negative impact, if security has to get in the way, uh, being upfront about what that's going to be and, uh, and show your work that you've done all you can to mitigate that. Mm -hmm. I just say panels like this, constantly talking about it, repeating it, uh, being transparent about breaches. Uh, one of the challenges in state and local is they'll get a ransomware attack and won't uh, disclose it, which means then they can't get the funding they need to get the technology in place to actually make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, so there's a, a, a real need to be transparent about uh, the 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 effects of not being protected and the cost. Yeah, and you know, one of my sincere hopes is that one of the um, you know, effects of this COVID time period is that uh, at least for industry that this uh, resiliency becomes a C-suite issue. Um, I, think, uh, I think it will, I mean, it affects the bottom line and the, and the, and the uh, absolute existence uh, of the organization. So I think it's going to get the attention it deserves going forward. Well, how do you think we find that right approach that ensures resilience without any disruption of productivity? Uh, it, it's obviously a balance there. Um, when we make the investments, we're making investments in modernization, but there is a risk there that we need to try and avoid uh, w where we might potentially introduce a new system that Maybe we didn't beta test well enough and it takes our system offline and there's an operational impact. Where do you think that balance is and how do we ensure um, that we do not have a loss of productivity? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that is, that is key, finding that um, right balance, uh, identifying those uh, efficiencies that'll come from uh, IT modernization and balancing, uh, balancing that risk on moving forward. Where that fulcrum uh, point exists, I think, depends uh, on the on the organization itself and their risk, uh, perhaps their risk for tolerance in this case. John, Greg, thoughts? Tolerance of risk. Yeah, yeah um, you know, I certainly don't advise you hacking the board or hacking the <laughs> an officer. Uh, <laughs> don't do that, you kids at home. Um, you know, I think there's uh, that whole issue of experience, you know, the customer or citizen experience is a big part of it. And that goes beyond just sort of that initial application. You know, when we look at, for example, you know, with, uh, you know, the uh, electronic voting or, uh, you know, voting machines is part of that. You know, security goes beyond just the device. It has to be that whole supply chain has to be, uh, you know, the start to finish. And I think a lot of the security cases we, we make too often to management are just about that immediate cost and immediate impact. Uh, not looking at life cycle, especially retiring stuff. I really like that question you asked earlier on about, you know, where are you going to spend your next dollar? Uh, because my automatic reaction is, um, what about the other $9 I've spent already? And how can I maybe retire some of those to get more of those single dollars? Yeah, I, I would agree the same. I'll just uh, add an anecdote. I do have a customer who wanted to know if we could still protect Windows 311 devices, <laughs> right? Uh, that uh, now I was around at Microsoft at the time, so it put a smile to my face. But at the same time, uh, you're putting yourself at risk if you're using technology that's that old. Big risk. Our last question, I guess, because we have 10 minutes and, uh, you know, kind of answer the question, but then maybe just some parting uh, thoughts and comments from uh, our panelists here. We can go to all three. Uh, what do you think the largest challenges are in increasing organizational uh, resilience, what, what, what are the pain points, what are the gaps, what are the issues? And then, um, you know, again, I uh, want to thank everyone for participating, but uh, you're also your, your parting thoughts for uh, maybe some thought leadership, some, something that our participants who are listening in right now can pull out of their back pocket tomorrow to make their program more hardened, more secure, and more resilient. Well, I would say, you know, um, cloud being a uh, and the move to cloud and seeing how um, it resulted during this pandemic is is uh, important. So making that case 
um, that it's not just moving to the cloud doesn't just save money, but that there are a whole lot of other uh, benefits, including the ability to be nimble and to pivot and to scale um, during these times of crisis. I would just add that, uh, uh, you know, there's a fixed bucket of money agencies, businesses have. So I understand you can't just throw out everything and start from scratch, but there are some small steps you can make like uh, patch management, keeping your systems up to date, making sure you have a good antivirus system or a good backup and recovery system that are not that expensive that uh, would really uh, get you started on that path. And security from the beginning by design, it can't, it just can't be anymore an afterthought. It just can't. Yeah, for me, as you move to cloud services, um, you know, the cloud is only going to be as secure as you make it. Uh, it doesn't come out of the box secure. So, uh, you know, organizations, as they move there, um, you can achieve whatever level of cloud security you want. You just have to plan for it. One of the encouraging uh, signs we've had in the last while is that a lot of the content we're seeing uh, read now is long form. And by that, I mean, people are studying more. They're doing more planning. And it's a great opportunity to fix those problems and security you had and move forward. Um, you've got permission now to do it. So take the planning and, and maybe be um, a little more, um, you know, uh, fast in your in your plans than you were previously, because uh, you know we've got the time to plan right now. Uh, there's resources and and executive will to to do better in security. So, you know, I think as a security community, a lot of that is uh, is now in our laps. All right, I want to thank our uh, panelists, uh, John, Bill, and Greg. Appreciate uh, your guys' leadership. Uh, where you are trying to take the industry. We're all in this together. It's not just a government thing. It's not just a private sector uh, thing. Um, we, we're, it's collective defense and we need your input just as much as the government uh, needs the private sector's input. And it's a big giant circle and it's very cyclical and I appreciate it. Um, I do wanna turn it over to our hosts, uh, Vince. Uh, dare I say, rich conversation, one of the better of the day. Uh, so, so thank you very much uh, to, the, to the chamber for having us. Ryan, thanks very much, and, and thanks to all the participants for, for joining uh, this afternoon's uh, breakout session. Um, just to put a final point on it, um, you asked a question, I didn't pipe up, uh, but I think CISA is one of the best partners that the business Absolutely. community has had um, over the past uh, several weeks and months between you and Brian Ware um, and Director Krebs um, have been terrific partners um, through your stakeholder engagement, through providing timely, actionable, um, and, and fiercely relevant resources that have, have made significant impacts um, to operations um, um, across, the, across the country um, and certainly in our North and South American supply chains as well. Um, so um, on behalf of the chamber, our members, um, thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone for, for tuning in uh, this afternoon. Uh, the conversation continues. Um, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us um, here at the chamber and we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you and we're adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you.